السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف النبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين We talked earlier in the khutbah about some of the components that the Prophet وسلم, used to build the internal structure of his community. Um, number one was ikhlas, sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we can't emphasize that enough. Um, a lot of the, um, a lot of the um, activities that have failed in the Islamic community has been due to people personalizing the activities, whether in the masjid or outside the masjid or in the community, people begin to make it about themselves and forget that it's not about you, it's about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كَمَا اسْتَخْلَفَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ وَلَا يُمَكِّنَنَّ لَهُمْ دِينَهُمْ الَّذِي إِرْتَضَى لَهُمْ وَلَا يُبَدِّلَنَّ لَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ خَوْفِهِمْ أَمْنًا And I'm going to stop right there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He promises those from amongst you who believe and do righteous deeds that He will make you, establish you in the earth. He will establish you firmly in the earth. That like he has established those that came before you, and he will make and he will make your deen firm, the deen that he is pleased with for you, and he will change the fear that you are experiencing from fear to safety. Three things that Allah is promising here. Those who believe or twice his deeds, number one. That he will make you firmly, establish you firmly in the earth. Right? And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala establish establishes someone or something firmly in the earth, it doesn't go away. It is something that is, it becomes historic because people will remember it after time. As Allah mentions in another ayah in the Quran, وَأَمَّا زَبَدُ فَيَذْهَبُ جُفَاءً that as for the foam of the ocean, it will wash, it will wash away with no benefit. It will wash away with no benefit. As for that which will be a benefit to the people, Allah will make it rooted firmly in the earth. It's not going to go anywhere. Think about the pages of history that we turn, page after page after page, and we find that there are some people who their history was documented and recorded, and generation after generation after generation reads that history and benefits from that history. It's not going anywhere. And then think about other people who have come and gone in this life, and nobody knew nothing about them. <laughs> people didn't even know that they existed. And that's because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes you, firmly establishes you in the earth, it becomes historic and everyone knows you and everyone will recall the, um, the things that you left behind for people to benefit from. So when Allah says, لا يستخلفنهم في الأرض, He will make them firmly established in the earth, just like He made those who came before them firmly established in the earth. Number one. Number two, ولا يمكننن لهم دينهم and you will uh, give them control and authority over the religion that he has given them and make that firm. And then he will change the khawf, the fear that they experience to amna, to safety and security. All of these three things, when you think about these benefits, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the agenda, the goal of all of this. Going back to the issue of ikhlas, the ending part of the ayah defines the goal of all of that. And the ending of the ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? يَعْبُدُونَنِي وَلَا يُشْرِكُونَ بِشَيْئًا That they will worship, so all of this, so they will worship me alone and not associate anyone as a partner with me. So this is the goal. And this shows, of course, here again, the importance of tawheed. 
people say, well, you know, we don't really need to study Tawheed today because we have more social issues. True, we do have social issues, right? But even the social issues that we remedy today in our community is so that we can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala correctly. Right or wrong? Even the social issues. So don't put emphasis on social issues and belittle Tawheed in the process because the social issues that we deal with and that we remedy is so that people can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly. So we're having marital problems, right? If a man and wife is having marital problems in the home, it's difficult for them to have sakina, to mina, and to have tranquility and peace in the home, which begins to affect their worship. They go into the salat, you just had an argument with your wife, and then you make takbir Allahu Akbar, you're, you're angry, you're upset, and you're using the salat to try to quell whatever frustrations that you're dealing with. But you don't have the sakina, you don't have the tranquility or the peace in the prayer that you would normally have if you and your wife had not had an argument. So even when we deal with social issues like, um, you know, drug and alcohol abuse or marital problems, all of that is so people can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly. So we don't want to belittle to eat, you know, at the expense of raising the shatan, raising the um, issue of social you know, social change. All of it is intertwined, all of it is interconnected, and the ultimate goal, as Allah mentions in the ayah, la so that they can worship me alone and not associate partners. So the issue of ikhlas is, is important. It's important. Uh, there was an issue behind why this ayah was, re was revealed. One of the companions by the name of Rabia ibn Anas, he reported on the authority of Abu Aliya, who, who said that مَكَّثَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ بِمَكَّةِ عَشَرَ سِنِينَ بَعْدَمَا أَوْحَى اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِ خَائِفًا هُوَ وَأَصْحَابُ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى سِرًّا وَعَلَانِيًا ثُمَّ أَمْرَهُمْ بِالْهِجْرَةِ الْهِجْرَةِ إِلَى الْمَدِينَةِ وَكَانُوا بِهَا خَائِفِينَ يُصْبِحُونَ بِالسِّلَاحِ Abu Ali, he said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he remained in, in Mecca for 10 years after Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed revelation to him. And we know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stayed in Mecca for actually 13 years, not 10 years. Um, nonetheless, he said that while he was in Mecca, Kha'ifan, who are what ashabu, was in fear, was in fear of his life, fear of his religion. And he used to give da'wah, used to call to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sirran wa alaniyah, in secret and in public. He said, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him to make hijrah, to migrate from Mecca to Medina. And when he got to Medina, ma'zalu kha'ifin, they were still in fear because they were a minority. They had very little resources. They were in fear of their lives. He said, yusbihuna fi silah. They used to wake up with their weapons on them and go to sleep with their weapons on them. Can you imagine? Can you imagine waking up, checking them, the first thing you're checking for to make sure you still have your sword, make sure you still have your armor, your shield, everything is close by you. Who wants to live like that? Waking up every day. And I mean, I can relate to that personally. You know, my life as a non-Muslim, you know, living, you know, a particular lifestyle, um, a very... And our children buy into that, not really understanding the repercussions of living that lifestyle. You don't, you don't have any peace, any comfort in your life. You have to walk around with a gun on you every day, constantly looking over your shoulders, constantly not knowing who is your enemy. At any given time, someone can take your life. That is fear. They went to sleep with their weapons and they woke up with their weapons. So this particular companion, فَقَالَ رَجْلٌ مِنْ أَصْحَابِهِ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ مَا يَأْتِ عَلَيْنَا يَوْمٌ نَأْمًا فِيهِ وَنَضْعَ فِيهِ الصِّلَاحِ فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى هَذِهِ الْآيَةِ So one of the companions, he said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Messenger of Allah, will there ever come a day, will there ever come a day where we will have safety and security 
And we can put our weapons down and we don't have to live like this. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed that ayah. So, that, you know, just a little history about the ayah. But everything makes its way back to ikhlas. That is the ultimate goal. And the Prophet sallallahu never lost sight of that goal. And part of the reason why we have so much discord and so much conflict amongst us as Muslims is because we don't have a common enemy. Because we don't have a common enemy, we make one another the enemy. It's what husband and wife do. Husband and wife, when they're in the home, because they don't have a common enemy, they make each other the enemy. The husband looks at his wife as she's the enemy. The wife looks at the husband as he's the enemy. And they end up literally making each other the enemy. I'm not your enemy. As a Muslim, I'm not your enemy. But we don't have a common enemy. And our common enemy is shaitan. Make no mistake about it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it very clear. He is a clear and open manifest enemy to you. We have a clear enemy. But we just haven't acknowledged that this is the enemy. And so as a result, we begin to look at one another as an enemy. He's an enemy because he wears a beard, he wears a thobe, he's a Wahhabi, he's a Salafi, he's this, he's that. He's the enemy because he doesn't have a beard, his pants is not above his ankles, he's a Khwani, he's this, he's that. We've literally made each other the enemy. Literally. While the shaitan continues to cause discord and disrupt our ranks. The Prophet wasallam, they never, they never looked at each other as the enemy because they had a common goal which was to build a community. Number two, that what we mentioned in the, in the khutbah was the components that the Prophet ﷺ used to establish the internal structure of the, masjid, of, of the community, which was the masjid. And we mentioned some of the roles, the different roles that the masjid played in the community of the Prophet ﷺ. It wasn't just a place to pray. We mentioned that there were people who used to live in the masjid. It was a home for people. People used to come to the masjid to learn. They used to come to the masjid to seek knowledge. They used to come to the masjid um, when they had problems with their wives. It was a place of refuge from the dunya and from things that bothered them. All right, so the, the masjid had a number of roles to play. And the building of the masjid was ultimately for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again. Here again, going back to that initial agenda, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ the masajids belong to Allah. The masjids belong to Allah. So do not associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not supplicate to anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even the masajid, the goal of building a masjid is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's for the believers to worship. And today Muslims have literally made the masajid their own personal property. We put our name on the masjid, on the deed of the masjid, my name, the masjid is in my name, and it literally is my property. And if I don't want you or you or you to come to the masjid, I will see to it that masjid. From coming and establishing the salat, wasa'afi kharabiha, and works towards the destruction of the masjid. And this is what you find today. Many boards, administration boards, work towards the destruction of the masjid. Not the building of the masjid. Because they've personalized. Personalized the masjid. Allah says, وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدًا The masjids belong to Allah. They belong to Allah. So do not supplicate uh, or worship anything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number three was the brotherhood, the camaraderie between the believers. Which is the glue that holds everything together. Because you cannot have a community, you cannot have a masjid, you cannot have an agenda without brotherhood. That is the glue that holds everything together. And the Prophet Sallallahu understood that. And that is even done for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. The brotherhood is done for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Here again, and you can see with each, each component, it all had the same agenda. The agenda was consolidated to one, and that was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in an authentic hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala يَقُولُ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَيْنَ الْمُتَحَابُونَ بِجَلَالَةِ بِجَلَالِ 
وظلهم يوم وظلهم بذل يوم لا ظل إلا ذل الله سبحانه وتعالى وصي on the day of judgment أين المتحابون بجلالي where are those who used to love each other for my sake where are those who used to love each other for my sake Today, I will shade them with a shade where there will be no shade except my shade. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where are those who loved each other for my pleasure, for my sake? So now we want to look at some of the external components that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made use of to build his community. Something that I think that we take for granted today. And something that I believe that we don't place a lot of emphasis on today. And I'll, and I'll just mention a couple of them. Um, just for the sake of time. Uh, the first and the most important of these external components was the financial stability. The community cannot thrive. The community cannot develop unless there is some financial stability. Period. It can't. Islam requires too much. There are even acts of worship in Islam that we can't perform without money. Like what? Hajj. Hajj. What else? Zakat. Zakat. Umrah. These are acts of worship that we cannot perform without money. Jihad. Can't go to jihad without money. You can't do anything. Any of these issues that we just mentioned. Any of these acts of worship without money. Some of the Sahaba didn't have a horse to ride on, didn't have an animal to ride on to go out and fight jihad. And their eyes would well up with tears and cry, as Allah mentions in the Quran. Their eyes would shed tears because they didn't have enough to go out and go fight. They wanted to go fight, but they didn't have any money. They didn't have a riding animal. They didn't have armor. They didn't have a weapon. So there's acts of worship in Islam that we cannot perform without money. Which highlights the importance of having money. And this deen is not a religion. This religion of Islam is not a, a religion that, you know, prides itself on being poor. You know, you have Muslims who blame other Muslims, find fault with other Muslims, and call each other worldly. Or, you, 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 you know, you're too involved with the dunya. You're too worldly. Who are you to say that I'm too worldly? That is your opinion. But what, what does that mean when you say a person is too worldly? He's too much about the dunya. What does that even mean? <laughs> because you are looking at it from your perspective. But, you know, there were many companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that were, if we wanted to use the term, worldly. Had money. And they didn't mind flaunting what they had. And we'll mention, I'll mention some examples so that we're clear about that. And I think that when we look at the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu sometimes we look with a black and white lens. It was either this or that. There was no in between. And that's a very immature outlook when you're looking from a religious perspective. Very immature. Okay? So there were, um, obviously there were financial contributions that were made to the Prophet Sallallahu But let's deal with the mandatory Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the sharia mandated certain financial obligations on the believers. Let's start with zakat. Okay? Zakat is a pillar from the pillars of Islam. And it is an obligation on every Muslim who meets the criterion to give zakat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a very beautiful, many ayats in the Quran about zakat. I chose one in particular. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Khud. من أموالهم صدقة تطهرهم وتزكيهم بها وصلي عليهم إن صلاتك سكن لهم والله سميع عليم الله سبحانه وتعالى is a command he said خذ in a command form خذ من أموالهم take from their wealth this was actually the first ayah that was revealed about zakat commanding the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم to take from their wealth, to take from their wealth. خُذْ مِنَ مُوَالِهِمْ صَدَقَةٍ Take from their wealth, all right? And of course, when Allah commands him to take from their wealth, we're talking about zakat. 
Because zakah is a fard, fard ayn. Ala kulli muslim. It is an individual obligation upon every muslim who of course meets, you know, the criterion to give zakah. But Allah says, take from their wealth. And Allah doesn't command him to do something except that it is wajib. So it wasn't, an, you know, it wasn't mustahab, it wasn't something that was recommended, it was an obligation. Take from their wealth, sadaqatan. Well, listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Take from their wealth as a charity for them. Because when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa took the zakat from them, where did the zakat go? Where did the zakat go? It was distributed amongst the companions based upon the ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in Surah Tawbah about the asnaf man yastahiq zakat of the different categories of people that are deserving of zakat. And there are nine that Allah mentioned in the ayah. Nine people that deserve zakat. So when the Prophet وسلم, took the zakat from them and distributed amongst his companions, it became a sadaqah on their behalf. It became a sadaqah on their behalf. So they paid the zakat, but the money that was distributed to the people, all right, that was also a sadaqah to go in their scales of good deeds. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned to tahiruhum wa to zakihim biha. Because zakat, when you look at the word zakat, it comes from the word zakat. You zakki, zakatan. Zakat, or tazkiya, bi ma'na an namu. The word zakat, it means growth and development. Growth, the growth of something, an increase in something. That's what the word zakat means, literally. So how does that fit in with the ayat? Allah says, take from their wealth that will be a charity on their behalf and will purify them and increase. What to zakihim biha as a tazkiyah huna raf al daraja in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he will purify them with it and it will be a means for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase and raise their status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is what the zakat did for the believers. And they didn't look at the zakat as a burden as you have Muslims today who avoid giving zakat. You have Muslims today who meet the bare minimum and the bare minimum for zakat, and of course it fluctuates every year because the dollar fluctuates every year, but it's roughly around $51, $5,200. If you have that, and you have that put to the side that you're not gonna do anything with it, then after it sits for a year, you have to take 2.5% of that and give it as zakat. You have to. Uh, but we don't have, we don't live under Islamic authority. So there's no one coming to us and taking the zakat from us. But it still leaves the individual obligation on the believers. Nonetheless, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions in another ayah, which shows us that in order to raise your status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to give. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ you will never attain righteousness until you spend from what you love. And obviously what you love is money. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَتُحِبُّونَ الْمَالَ حُبَّ الْجَمَّةِ And you love mal, you love wealth, you love money severely. You love it. And you can only attain righteousness after you give from what you love. Allah to the anhum ajma'een. On one occasion, one of them woke up late for Salatul Fajr. He woke up late for Salatul Fajr. And he felt so bad that he woke up late for Salatul Fajr. He took his garden. He had a garden. He took it and he gave it to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, Khudha ya Rasulullah wa da'ha haythu ma shit la'allallaha an yaghfir li. He said, O Messenger of Allah, take this garden and give it to whomsoever you will. Perhaps Allah will forgive me for waking up late for Salatul Fajr. He spent from what he loved. They would do that as a form of, you know, punishment for themselves. You know, hoping that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would see their sincerity and forgive them. But he woke up late for Salatul Fajr. And as a result of that, he gave his whole garden away, sadaqah. 
hoping that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive him. Spending from what he loved, giving away something that was dear to him, precious to him. So the Sahaba, they didn't look at sadaqah, they didn't look at zakat as subtracting from their wealth. Many Muslims today, we, you know, penny pinch when it comes to sadaqah and zakat. Because we look at it as, I don't really have enough money right now, or I'm going to just spend $5, I'm going to just give $10. Because you're looking at it as a decrease in your money. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Man naqasa, sadaqatun min man. That sadaqah, charity, does not cause your wealth to decrease. It does not. You're looking at it with your physical eye, saying if I put this $20 in the sadaqah box, I'm no longer going to have $20 in my pocket. But what you did with the $20, when you put it in the sadaqah box, where did the $20 go? Where did it go? The charity. No. I mean, physically the money left your hand, but where did it go? It went in your hisab. <laughs> He said, في اليوم في اليوم الآخر يوم القيامة عندك حساب يوم القيامة it went in your account not in your account in this life in your account in the hereafter we have an account in the hereafter just like you have a bank account in this life that is reminiscent of what you have in the hereafter you have an account in the hereafter as well although it's not money it's good deeds. So in this life, you check your bank account, you manage your bank book, you manage your bank account, you constantly check in how much you spent today, or how much you need to put back to make that back up, right? Why don't we do that when it comes to our good deeds? We don't look at how many good, you look on Twitter, right? And you'll find people say, well, today's stats. I had two followers today, one unfollower, and you know, you count counting your stats. How, how many of us count our stats? How many good deeds? How many people did you give salam to today? You walked past 50 people. You gave 50 people the salam. And each person you said assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 50 people. And when you say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, that's 30 hasanat. 30. Multiply 30 times 50. 30 times 50. You get what, brother? Tell me you get what money. 150. 150, right? 30 times, no, 30 1500. times, 1,500. I add another zero to that, right? That's 1,500 hasanat just for giving people salam. <laughs> just for giving people salam. Today's stats, I walked past 50 Muslims today. I said, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And for each time I said that, there was 30 hasanat, 30 times 50, 1,500 hasanat just for giving the salam. The Prophet Sallallahu he said that every harf that you recite from the Qur'an, uh, you get a hasana. Wal hasana bi ashri amthariha. That every harf, every time you recite one letter from the Qur'an, you get ten hasanat. For every letter. Tayyip, how many letters is in Al-Fatiha? Anyone know? How many letters is in Al-Fatiha? Do the math for you. There are 114 letters in Al-Fatiha. Tayyip. So, 10 hasanat for every letter. 10 times 14, 114 is what? 10,000. No. 100, 140. 140. 1,400. 114 multiplied by 10. No. 1140. 1140. Okay, 1,140. And that is just for um, reciting Al-Fatiha one time. How many times do we recite Al-Fatiha in a day? 17. Multiply 1,140 times 17. You get what? And you do the math. <laughs> you do the math. That's just for reciting Al-Fatiha. Today's stats... <laughs> This is, this is how you calculate your good deeds. And you go to bed at least with some type of hope, some type of raja. SubhanAllah, these are my stats for today. I'm doing, I'm doing my bank book. You contact somebody and say, what are you doing? I'm, I'm doing my, you know, checking my account. I'm checking my account for the hereafter, not in this life. 
You know, and these are things that, you know, we kind of just do good deeds in hopes that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would acknowledge it as a good deed. But these are the things that increase our hope for Allah's mercy. As believers, we live in between the two extremes of fear and hope. Khawf wa raja. Between the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will not accept anything from us. And the hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have mercy upon us and look at the good deeds and acknowledge what we've done with pure sincerity to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So, um, the sadaqah or, or the um, zakat, this is, you know, was one of the ways that they used to generate money through to, to, to help fortify the community financially. Another way that they would generate money was through involuntary or voluntary acts of sadaqah, of charity. People just giving and sometimes they would give on specific occasions. There would be certain occasions that the Prophet Sallallahu would concentrate on getting more sadaqah from the believers. On the authority of Abdullah bin Abbas he said that the Prophet Sallallahu al-Fitr يعني Eid al-Fitr the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abdullah bin Abbas, he said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the day of the Eid al-Fitr, which is the Eid that commemorates the completion of Ramadan, right? Eid al-Fitr, the Prophet Sallallahu would pray the Salat to Eid two rak'ah. He would not pray before or after, meaning there's no sunnah prayers before the Eid or after the Eid. No sunnah prayers. When the Imam comes, take, we, start the, we start the Salat. The Imam does not come to the place where the Eid is going to pray, pray two rak'ah and sit down and congregate and conversate and converse with the believers. No. When the Imam comes, that is when the Salat starts. He didn't pray any sunnah prayers before the Eid, nor did he pray any sunnah prayers after the Eid. Right? He said, and he would pray two rak'ah. And after he prayed Salatul Eid, he would give a khutbah and he would go over to the women and he would speak to the women specifically, right? And he would encourage the women to give sadaqah. And with him would be Bilal. And Bilal would hold his thobe out and the women would, be take, the women would take off of their bangles and their necklaces and they would throw it in the thobe of Bilal. And he would catch it, the jewelry, and would take it back and they would use that wealth for the community. They would use that wealth for the community. This was not zakat al-fitr. Zakat al-fitr should not be paid in money. Zakat al-fitr is paid with food. And that is a sunnah. And an a easy way, because many of us live in this society and people, when they need food, they go to the government for food. They don't necessarily need um, to wait till the day of the Eid for, for, for food. They get government assistance for food. And some people may have a food card with money on it and may not necessarily need food, but they may need money. They may need money. So what you could do is uh, put your money on a food card. Use the money for food if they need it. Or they could use it for whatever other reasons they can use it for. Nonetheless, you're still not giving it to them in money. It's a food voucher. It's a food voucher. Okay. So that's an easy way to solve that problem. And when I was the Imam of the Masjid, this is exactly what we did. We combined Jama'a Bain al Khairain. We combined the, the good, the two goods, the two good deeds. And that is that some people uh, wanted to give money. So we took the money and we put the money on a food card voucher. And then those believers that needed the food for Zakat al Fitr, we would give them the food card voucher and they could go to the store and buy whatever food they want. Because if we stuck to the sunnah, then we would be given barley, wheat, rice. People don't need those things. People don't need, we, we live in a different environment, a different society. And we have to be able to use, you know, common sense. And of course the Prophet Sallallahu this is what they gave, dates. They would give, you know, a, a sa'a of dates. But people don't eat. A lot of American Muslims don't eat dates. <laughs> Some of my children don't eat dates. They don't like them. For whatever reason. 
But my point is, is that we have to be able to combine, um, as Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahim Allah ta'ala said about the Sahaba, that when they gave fatawa or when they engaged people academically, jama'a bain al-aql wa naql that they combine the use of revelation and common sense. <laughs> All right? So we have to use common sense and revelation. Not just common sense excluding revelation and not just revelation excluding common sense. A combination of the both. Okay? So they would give, they would throw their bangles and their necklaces in the thob of Bilal and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would make use make use of it. وقد جاء في الحديث كان عمر رضي الله تعالى عنه يقول كنت أتمنى أن أصدق أبا بكر that there was another hadith and this hadith was centered around غزوة تبوك the battle of Tabuk which was called غزوة العسرة which was called the difficult battle as Allah سبحانه وتعالى mentioned in the Quran لقد تاب الله على على النبي والمهاجرين والأنصار الذين تبعوك في ساعة العسرة من بعد uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah At-Tawbah that indeed Allah has turned in repentance to the Prophet and the Muhajireen and the Ansar and those that followed him in the difficult hour. In the difficult hour when some of the hearts of a group from amongst them almost turned around. And this was because in, during this battle they were up against a lot of odds. Number one, they had very little people, Kilitazad. They had very little resources. They had very little riding animals. And not only that, it was at a time when it was extremely hot. Shiddatul Har. And on top of that, it was at a time when a lot of their fruits and vegetables had already begun to bud. And they wanted to take those things to the marketplace and make money. So instead of making money, they had to go fight jihad. And it really was a difficulty on the companions during that time. But during this time, the Prophet ﷺ encouraged them to give sabaqah. فَأَمَرَ النَّبِيُّ صلى الله عليه وسلم النَّاسِ بِالسَّبَقَةِ وَحَثَّهُمْ عَلَى النَّفَقَةِ وَحِمْلَانِ فَجَاءُوا بِالسَّبَقَاتِ كَثِيرًا فَكَانَ أَوَّلُ مَنْ جَاءَ أَبُو بَكْرَ السَّدِيقُ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى عَنْهُ بِمَالِهِ كُلِّهِ أَرْبَعَةَ آلَافٍ دِرْهَمٍ أنفقه في سبيل الله فقال له النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يا أبا بكر ماذا تركت لأهلك قال تركت لأهلي الله ورسوله لا إله إلا الله So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم encouraged the Sahaba to give sadaqah because this army that's going out they need you know they need to they need supplies they need food they need water they need riding animals they need armor they need weapons a lot of them were poor some of them didn't have anything so the Prophet ﷺ encouraged the Sahaba to give. Okay? The first one to come and give was Abu Bakr. Tabai. <coughs> of course, without a doubt. Omar said, Kuntu atamanna an asbiq Abu Bakr. He said, Omar said that I wish that I could outdo Abu Bakr in any act of good. He always beat me to it. Always. He said the first one to come was Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr came with all of his wealth, everything that he owned. 4,000 dirhams. 4,000 dirhams. He came and he dropped it in front of the Prophet. ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ asked uh, Abu Bakr, What did you leave for your family? He said, I left my family Allah and his messenger. I left my family Allah and his messenger. Because this was ultimately going towards the community. So it wasn't a loss to the family. Today we look at, you know, there's a project, you know, building a masjid, helping the school out. We need funds, we need donations. And we look at it as, you know, my, you know, my bank account is not really, you know, I'm not really, you know, I'm struggling myself right now. Because we don't look at it as a communal benefit. We look at it as a personal benefit. But it, Abu Bakr didn't look at it as a benefit. He still, his family still is okay. They're in the community. People are not going to let you starve. People are not going to let you, you know, become homeless. You're, you're protected. There's a glove. You know, and we don't have that in our communities. Unfortunately, a Muslim is struggling with something. You can rarely find a Muslim that you can go to to help you out. I mean, we need, we need help right here at the school. Just to come, physical bodies to come and help out at the school. 
We're not asking for money. We're just asking to come and lend the physical body to help knock down the walls. And, you know, we'll see the type of response that we get. And we're not even asking for money. So imagine, you know, when it comes time to ask for money, something that people hold dearly. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Ibn Adam the Prophet has said if the son of Adam had a valley of money, he would desire a second valley. And if he had a second valley of, of money, he would be the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Umar, Mada Tarakta li Ahlik, Kala Taraktu li Ahli Mithlahu. Thumma Jalasa Umar Yamvur ila Abi Bakr wa kala ma sabaktuhu fi shay. Abu Bakr came with his wealth and he gave half to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he left half for his family. The Prophet ﷺ asked him, Omar, what did you leave for your family? He said, I left my family the exact same amount that I'm giving you. Meaning, I split my wealth in half, I gave you half, and I, get, and I left the other half for my family. And then he turned to Abu Bakr and he looked at him and he said, I can't outdo you in anything. You beat me at, every, at everything. So then some of the other companions came with their wealth. Ja Abdurrahman ibn Awf, bi mi'atay awqiya. وعاصم ابن عدي بسبعين وسقا من تمر وجهز عثمان ثرث الجيش وجهزهم بتسعمية وخمسين بعيرا وبخمسين فرسا وقال ابن إسحاق أنفق عثمان في ذلك الجيش نفقة عظيمة لم ينفق لم ينفق أحد مثله. So another companion of Rahman ibn Auf wealthy. Wealthy companion, we talked about him in the khutbah. Wealthy companion. He came and he bought 200 awqiya, which was a measure, a form of a weight. 200 awqiya. Then another companion by the name of Asim ibn Abdi. He came with uh, 70 wasqan. And for the sisters that were here earlier, um, earlier in the week, we talked about what a wasq is and what it equals. Um, and Uthman, anhu, he supplied, he took care of a whole third of the army. Uthman, he gave 950 camels. 950 camels. Where does a man get almost a thousand camels from? Where does a man, where is a man able to give 950 camels and still not be broke? They were, they were okay financially. They were okay financially. 950 camels. And then on top of that, he gave away 50 horses. 50 horses. So in total, a thousand animals, riding animals. He supplied a thousand riding animals to the army. Ibn Ishaq, one of the compilers of the Sirah, he said that Ruthman gave to this army and he spent on this army in the amount that no one would ever be able to compare to. وَقِيلَ جَاءَ عُثْمَانَ بِأَلْفِ دِنَارَ فِي كُمِّهِ حِينَ جَهَزَ الْجَيْشِ فَنَثَرَهَا فِي حِجْرِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فَقَبِلَهَا النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فِي حِجْرِ وَهُوَ يَقُولُ مَا دَرَّ عُثْمَانَ مَا عَمِلَ بَعْدَ الْيَوْمِ وَقَالَ مَنْ جَهَزَ الْجَيْسِ الْعُسْرَى فَلَهُ الْجَنَّةِ فَقَامَ عُثْمَانَ وَأَنْفَقَ هَذَا هَذِهِ النَّفَقَ That it was mentioned that Uthman also on top of the animals that he gave, he also gave a thousand dinars that he carried in his sleeve, wanted to hide the money. Hide the money. Carried it in his sleeve and he walked into the room of the Prophet ﷺ and gave it to him personally. The Prophet ﷺ took the money from Uthman and he said that nothing will harm Uthman after what he did today. He said, whoever supplies this army with what they need, then for him is paradise. Uthman said, I got it. Uthman was also the same one who purchased the land 
where the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ was built. Uthman purchased that land. When the camel began to walk, the Prophet ﷺ said, Da'aha fa inna ma'amura. Leave her because she's being commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And wherever the camel kneeled, that was the area that he was going to build the masjid. The place where the camel kneeled, it belonged to two orphans. The Prophet ﷺ asked, who are the two orphans so that we can purchase the property? Uthman went and purchased the property. I got it. I got it. Purchased the whole land. Purchased the land so that they could build the masjid there. This is, this is what I'm talking about. There, there had to be wealth involved in this. The community didn't just come out of nowhere. It wasn't just a, a, you know, a miracle that happened. Somebody snapped their fingers and the community just poof out of nowhere came into existence. These were people who were wealthy companions who gave their wealth for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another, uh, number three from the ways that they generated money was al fay which was, uh, they translated as um, the war booty or the war goods. But al fay uh, as the scholars mentioned, الفي كل مال أخذ من الكفار من غير قتال من غير قتال ولا إجاف الخير ولا ركاب كأموال بني النظير كما ذكر الله سبحانه وتعالى في الآية that الفي or what they translate as the, the war goods or the war booty it is any wealth that is taken from the non-Muslims without any fighting there's no fighting involved it's a peace treaty or an agreement that they make and the non-Muslims give the wealth for whatever reason. Like in the case of the Prophet Sallallahu and Bani Nadir. There were three tribes of the Jews that lived in Medina when the Prophet Sallallahu entered into Medina. Because Medina, which was Yathrib, all right, prior to the coming of the Prophet Sallallahu it belonged to Jews and Christians. That was the majority of the population there. However, when a group from those people came to Mecca and gave bay'ah to the Prophet ﷺ and the second bay'ah, the Prophet ﷺ told them to go back to Medina and give da'wah. They came back to give da'wah and it was a large group of Muslims waiting in Medina when the Prophet ﷺ finally migrated. But there was still a large presence of Jews, three main tribes. Anyone know the names of those tribes? One of them was Beni Nadir which his wife Safiya was from that tribe. She was a Jew prior to her embracing Islam. And her father, who the Prophet Sallallahu killed in one of the battles, he was the chief of the tribe, Bani Nadir. And, anyone know the other tribe? Bani Qa'a. And, there was one more, I'm forgetting the name. Thalath al Al Yahud. Bani Nadir, Qayna Ka'a, Qurayba. Jazakallah Khair. Tayyip. So these three tribes were there. The chief of those tribes, Bani Nadir, the Prophet ﷺ made a peace treaty with them when he first entered into Medina. That they would not fight against him, he would not fight against them. Alhamdulillah. Mutual agreement. And this is what we talked about in the khutbah of having ta'awun even with the kuffar. Having mutual cooperation even with non-Muslims. The Prophet said, this was mutual agreement. You are not going to fight against us, we will not fight against you. That is a mutual agreement that the Prophet wasallam made with non-Muslims. If the Prophet wasallam made an agreement with non-Muslims not to fight with one another, why can't we as Muslims make an agreement with each other? Why? Why? For the greater good of the Ummah. Why can't we have a peace treaty amongst us that there will not be any fighting, no warning, no, no this, no that, to cause disruption in the community? This was the Prophet ﷺ making a peace agreement with non-Muslims. And I'm not saying a peace agreement with Muslims based on batil, based upon some type of falsehood. But we're talking about a mutual cooperation. Mutual. Cooperation, that we will cooperate with one another for the greater good of the community as a whole. The Prophet ﷺ did it with non-Muslims. We can't do it with one another as Muslims. 
This, despite the fact that we may not believe the same things, the fight, despite the fact that we, our approach to Islam may be different. And I'm not justifying someone else's approach. If it's wrong, it's wrong. But the fact of the matter is that we all have to live in the community together. Nonetheless, the Prophet ﷺ made the peace agreement with them. Um, after the Prophet ﷺ won or succeeded in the battle of Badr, they continued with the, with the contract. However, when the Prophet ﷺ fought the battle of Uhud the following year, all right, in the third year after the Hijrah, and they saw that the Kufar of Quraysh kind of got won over, they broke the contract. They broke the peace treaty and they joined uh, with the uh, Ahzab, with the hypocrites as well as the, um, the Kufar of Quraysh during the battle of Ahzab in the fifth year. However, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this ayah, this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa authority over them and they made another agreement but when the Prophet made the agreement at this time they, it was money involved. We're not just making a peace agreement now. You're going to pay us now. Pay us what is rightfully ours. Because we gave you an option the first time to make a peace agreement and there was no fee involved. But this time, since you broke your contract, you fought against us, now we're going to make another peace agreement with you, but this time you will pay for it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أَفَاءَ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ رَسُولِهِ مِنْهُمْ فَمَا أَوْجَفْتُمْ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ خَيْنٍ وَلَا رِكَابٍ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يُسَلِّتُ رُسُلَهُ عَلَىٰ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَاللَّهُ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ لا إله إلا الله Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this ayah that what Allah gave to his messenger from the faith, from the war booty, and that was the money that they got from Beni Nadir. Then it's what Allah gave to you without any fighting, without riding any animals into, um, into their sanctuary to fight them. It is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to you. And Allah gives authority to his messengers over whomsoever he wills. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has power over all things into the community. And what did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa do with this money that he got from them? Listen to what Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu he said. قال عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله تعالى عنه كانت الأموال بني نظير مما أفاء الله على رسوله فكانت لرسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم خاصة فكان ينفق على أهله منها نفقة سنته وما بقي جعله في كراع وفي السلاح في سبيل الله Umar رضي الله تعالى عنه he said that the money that he got from Bani Nadir from this peace agreement all right, this peace treaty, it was for the Messenger of Allah specifically. It was for him specifically. This was his money that Allah gave to him. So that peace agreement, the money that came out of that, was specifically for the Prophet ﷺ. Umar said, what did he do with this money? He used to take the, a portion of the money and he would spend it on his family, on his wives, to last them for a whole year. SubhanAllah. So it wasn't that he was just a messenger of Allah and people were just giving him money and helping his family out. He was surviving off of the handouts of, of, of you know, the generosity of the Muslims. No, he, he had money. He had income coming in. And he spent on his family enough to last them for a whole year. A whole year. And this goes, you know, against what you find maybe some imams that totally rely on the generous handouts of, you know, the Muslims. No, we have to find something to supplement our income and not to say, well, you know, I'm giving da'wah fi sabidillah. You think about people who go on trips to give da'wah, all right, without mentioning any names. They go 40 days here, they go here to give da'wah. Who's there taking care of your family? Who is there satisfying the needs of your family? While you go out for X amount of days to give da'wah. That is a, um, you know, your home, your family, that is an individual obligation on you. And any negligence in that will have serious repercussions on the Day of Judgment. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, مَسْتَرَعَاهُ اللَّهُ عَبْدًا عَلَى رَعِيَّةٍ وَلَمْ يُحِدْهَا بِنُسْحِهِ أو بِنَسِيحَةِ بِنَسِيحَةٍ the Prophet said that Allah doesn't place any servant 
make him responsible over a group of people and he does not fulfill the rights of those people except that he will not smell the fragrance of paradise. لم يريح رائحة الجنة. He will not smell the fragrance of paradise. So, you know, we have to be careful not to be negligent in that regard. So the Prophet Sallallahu he would take a portion of this money and he would spend it on his family, enough to last them for a whole year. And what was left over, he would spend it for weapons and everything else that was needed for the cause of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. To further the spread of Islam and to protect the community. Because the weapons wasn't used to spread Islam. As many non-Muslims say that, you know, Islam was spread by the sword. Uh, Islam was spread by good character. Islam was spread by khuluq al-hasan, by good character, not by the sword. The sword was never used to spread Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, لا إكراه في الدين قد تبين الرشد من الغيب That there's no compulsion, no force in the religion. Truth stands out clear from falsehood. We don't have to force anybody to become Muslim. Truth stands out clear from falsehood. That in itself is enough. The religion of Islam speaks for itself. We don't have to, you know, force someone to become a Muslim. So Islam was not spread by the sword. Islam was spread by the generosity, the hospitality, the good character of the believers. As the saying goes that the sword is uh, mightier, I mean the pen is mightier than the sword. And that's exactly the why there was more benefit in Mecca than it was in Medina. So the uh, last, so let's just review. How many sources of money did we cover so far? Cover what? Zakat? What else? Sadaqah. Sadaqah. Sadaqah, okay. What else? Word, word, uh, not the word. Uh, al Yeah. Okay. The last, and, and there, there was more than this, but this is just what um, I gathered. Um, number four, from the sources of money that came to aid and assist in the building of the community, was personal wealth that he got from people that were close to him. And starting with his wife, Khadija. Now, she assisted him with her wealth. Aisha, anha. She mentioned in a very, you know, peculiar story. She said, مَا غِرْتُ عَلَى مْرَأَةٍ لِلنَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ قَطْ مَا غِرْتُ عَلَى خَدِيجَةٍ لِمَا كُنْتُ أَسْمَعْ أَسْمَعَهُ يَذْكُرُهَا وَأَمَرَهُ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى إِنْ يُبَشِّرَهَا بِبَيْتٍ مِنْ قَصَبٍ فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَإِنْ كَانَ لَيَذْبَحْ الشَّاتْ فَيُهْدِي إلى خلاء إلها منها ما يسعها ما يسعهن كأنه لم يكن في الدنيا امرأة إلا خديجة فقلت له مرة ماذا لماذا تذكر هذا العجوز وقد أبدلك الله خيرا منها فغضب النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وقال لها ماذا كل كيف قلت والله ما أبدأني الله خير منها الحديث عائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها she said I was never jealous over any of the wives of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم I was never jealous of any of them all right and a lot of times this is you know in polygyny or polygamy um, if you're married to more than one woman, a lot of times if she doesn't feel that she's threatened by the other woman, then it's not an issue. If she's threatened by the other woman, then there's going to be issues. She said, I was never jealous of any of his wives. She said, like I was jealous of Khadija. Because I used to hear him mention her all the time. Because he used to mention Khadija all the time. And this shows that if a man is married to more than one woman, then you don't mention the other wife in the presence of the other wife. This is just siyasa and nisa'iya. This is just women politics, right? She said, because I used to hear him mention her all the time. 
And because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet sallallahu to give glad tidings to Khadija of a mansion waiting for her in paradise. The jealousy. She said, and he used to slaughter. For he used to slaughter a lamb. And then he would feed the friends of Khadija out of respect for his wife. He would feed her friends. And Imam Bukhari actually mentions a chapter in his Sahih about taking care of the friends of your father. Your father used to honor a certain group of brothers. Even after your father passed, it is still the duty on the son to honor those men just like your father used to honor them. And this is exactly what the Prophet ﷺ did with the friends of Khadija. When Khadija died, he knew that she was fond of these particular women. So he, every now and then he would slaughter a lamb and he would feed those women until they, you know, had their full. She said, it was as if, It was as if there was no other woman in the world but Khadija. She said, so I got jealous on one occasion. And I said to him, why do you keep mentioning this old woman when Allah has given you better than her? Meaning me. Allah has given you better than her. I'm young, I'm vibrant, I'm beautiful. I'm better than her. Why do you keep mentioning this old woman when Allah has given you better? The Prophet ﷺ, he became extremely angry. And this shows that when a woman talks about another wife or another woman in her absence is considered backbiting and we shouldn't just brush that off because we don't want to get no you correct that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he became mad and he said to her kayfakulti what did you just say he said i swear by allah allah did not give me better than her meaning you are not better than khadija allah did not give me better than her and listen to what he said, which is the point of reference that I'm making here. He said, Wallahi ma abdalani Allahu khayra minha. Qala annaha saddaqani, saddaqatni, idh kaddabani al nas. Wa awatni, idh taradani al nas. Wa as'adatni bi maliha. Wa razakani Allahu subhanahu wa ta'ala al walid minha. Wa lam urzak min ghayriha. He said, Allah did not give me better than Khadija. He said, she believed in me when everybody else disbelieved in me. She was the only one that believed in me. And this is, shows that, that you don't forget the good that a person has done to you or for you. He said, she believed in me when everybody else disbelieved in me. And she gave me refuge when everybody else rejected me and she aided me with her money so and then, then then he said that you know Allah blessed me with children from her and I didn't have children by any other woman and of course we know that he had um, Ibrahim by Maria right uh, but other than that all of his children were from Khadija all of his children were from Khadija so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he's mentioning her virtues to kind of put Aisha back in her place, right? Going back to the per the point where she's where he said that she aided me with her money. Why did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam need money from Khadija? What did he, what did he do with the money? This we're talking about in Mecca here, all right? Because Khadija never made it to Medina, right? She never made it to Medina. She died in the tenth year before uh, after Revelation, right? Um, what the scholars call Amal Huzan, the, the year of grief for the Prophet ﷺ because he lost his uncle Abu Talib the same year. He lost Khadija um, and there were a lot of other things. The Muslims were being boycotted to the end of it. Um, what did he need with the wealth of Khadija while he was in Mecca? To help uh, the new Muslims who were being persecuted. How, how, okay, you, you're going somewhere with that. How did he help the new Muslims that were being persecuted? Uh, they were, most of them were poor. Okay. Uh, some of them slaves. 
He used the money to free the slaves that believed. When he found that there was someone that believed and he was a slave, he would take the money, go purchase their freedom because that added to the ranks of the believers. You can't give da'wah without money. We, we, can't, we, we need money to give da'wah. We need money to spread Islam. Islam is not going to spread with the type of fervor that we need it to without money. Islam can spread by itself, by word of mouth and character and things like that. But the fortification of a community, which would give it, you know, more strength and, and, and the power of it spreading would be, you know, obviously would be greater, has to be with, with money, financial stability. That home with two Christian parents. We're still in the same situation right now. And no one bails those people out. So a lot of those young brothers and sisters, they take Shahada, they go home. The girl, she catches it the worst because she tries to put on a Kimar or a hijab. And her mother says, where are you going with that? Don't wear that stuff in my house. Don't pray in my house. And a lot of us, we come from Muslim homes, so we, don't, we, we can never even fathom something like that. But me being a, a, a convert to Islam or revert to Islam, I can identify with that very much. I can identify with that very much. Because when you're talking about even the restrictions of praying, where do you pray when you you live with your grandmother? She has pictures of Jesus and the Last Supper on every wall in the home. How, how do they pray at home? How do we get them out of those situations? But because we don't have a system set up so when, non, when people take shahada and become Muslim and they're in situations like that, we have an outlet for them. We have alternatives for them. We don't have that. We just say, oh, mashallah, take beer, Allahu Akbar. When the person takes shahada, put a couple of dollars in their pocket, pat them on the back, give them a, you know, Quran, give them a book or two, and off you go. Nobody's really concerned with the type of environment that they're going back to. You look at the situation of Sulaiman and the Pharisee. When he was trying to find the truth, his father chained him up in the basement of his home. <coughs> To keep him from the truth. Some of the Sahaba, when the Prophet وسلم, made the peace treaty with the Kuffar of Quraysh and said that anyone who, take, who comes from you and takes Shahada, we're sending them back to you. We're sending them back. Some of the Sahaba had the, their, their tribes wanted them back. Now you're coming back to Mecca. Even while the Prophet وسلم, was signing the peace treaty, a man came in chains. He broke away from his father, came in chains. and said, oh, Messenger of Allah, don't send me back. The Prophet said, I signed the peace treaty already. I have to send you back. He said, I the kuffar. What can did to Muslim? Are you going to send me back to the kuffar and I've come to you as a Muslim? The Prophet said, my hands are tied. I can't do anything. I already signed the peace treaty. He said, Ismir, la'allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yaj'ala laka faraja wa makhraja. Be patient. Perhaps Allah will make a way out for you. <coughs> and subhanAllah, Allah made a way out for him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a way out for him. How did he get out of the situation? They were traveling. He escaped. He found the, built a little hut in the valley and used to rob the caravans and free anyone who was Muslim. Until the non-Muslims went back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, that clause, let's take that out of the contract. Whoever comes from us to you and becomes Muslim, they can stay. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala made it a way out for them. As Allah says in the Quran, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ وَمَن يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُ And whoever fears Allah, Allah will make a way out of every difficulty and will provide for you in ways in which you could never imagine. And whoever trusts in Allah, Allah is enough for you. Allah is sufficient for you. That's Allah the Afiyah wa Salama. And that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you will fitna wa iyaakum lima yuhibuhu wa yarubah. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslimin kathira. Wa subhanaka lahumma wa bihamdik. Wa shadu an la ilaha ila ant. Wa astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayhi.